Prior to the 1700s, the majority of people worked the land, living in small cottages, making their own goods, and knowing little about the world that existed just miles beyond their homes. In the early 1700s, this all changed with the beginning of an agricultural revolution, which greatly improved the quality and quantity of food. New techniques, such as the construction of dikes, allowed Dutch farmers to expand arable farmland, and the introduction of a variety of fertilizers resulted in higher yields. These ideas spread from the Netherlands to Great Britain, where they were perfected, and techniques like crop rotation were introduced. The invention of the seed driller also helped produce more food and acted as inspiration for later machinery. The increased prosperity brought by the agricultural revolution would sustain the population and assist in the beginnings of the industrial revolution. As rich landowners started enclosing the land of the poor, these once devote farmers needed new jobs and they migrated to large cities. This growing labor force would soon work the machines that were introduced in the Industrial Revolution. As the Industrial Revolution came to fruition and people moved to urban areas, the simple farming lifestyle slowly began to fade into the past. A technological revolution occurred simultaneously with the agricultural revolution in the early 1700s. New sources of energy and materials for construction would drastically change the efficiency of work. People began to harness the power of nature using water mills and windmills to accomplish tasks much faster. The burning of coal led Thomas Newcomen to inventing the steam engine in 1712. Improvements to the steam engine made by James Watt helped it become the main source of power for many factories during the Industrial Revolution. In 1709, the Darby family began smelting iron using the heat produced from burning coal to separate it from its ores. This purification process caused iron to be far more durable and less expensive. Iron would begin to be used to create machinery that would establish the factory system. The culmination of the effects from the agricultural and technological revolutions of the early 18th century manifested into the Industrial Revolution in Britain. The small country had abundant supplies of coal, iron, and other resources to create and power machinery used in factories. Britain also had a rather large population which required the production of more goods. The people were in need of new jobs due to the massive unemployment caused by the lack of small farms. Furthermore, the economy of Britain prospered as a result of heavy trading and industries, such as the slave trade, the wealthy were ready to invest in new areas. Great Britain would soon be plunged into the Industrial Revolution and reap all of its benefits. Now, let's take a look at the creation of the factory system and how it contributed to the Industrial Revolution. Imagine the year 1768 and Richard Arkwright has just patented the spinning frame, a simple basic machine that can spin threads of yarn from basic materials like wool or cotton. Little did he know this seemingly insignificant invention would be the spark that ignited the flame of a cultural and industrial revolution an event that would change manufacturing and the world as we know it forever. My name is Alex Walsh and welcome to the Hoodle Stoodle Rudel channel. Today we will be taking you on a journey through time all the way back to Britain during the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution when Richard Arkwright opened his first factory in Cromford, a small town in Great Britain. His spinning frames could weave 128 threads at a time, much faster than any human could work, and the final products were far more durable than ones made by hand. In 1769, Arkwright saw the potential to start an entirely new form of manufacturing and established the first factory. Arkwright began building large sheds in Cromford to house the massive machinery needed to produce threads. Upon its opening, the first factory employed 300 people. This was in direct contrast to the work system of the day where a single family worked from their home. In a short 20 years, Arkwright's small factory had grown in size employing almost over 800 workers, almost all of whom were unskilled. Those unskilled laborers who desperately needed a job did the monotonous work of managing the machinery. We're just gonna keep it. The factory system functioned on strict rules. 
While at work, there were almost no breaks, and talking or whistling was prohibited. Each employee was required to do a specific job for a set number of hours. They were governed by the factory's demands and by the time on the clock. No breaks! I don't know how I would have survived without my lunch break. Following in the steps of Richard Arkwright, Edmund Cartwright, a clergyman turned inventor, began the construction of factories to house his power looms. In 1785, the first power loom had all but completely replaced the jobs of skilled weavers in only 30 years. In 1813, there were a mere 2,400 looms in service in Britain, but by 1850, there were over 250,000. Before the factory system of manufacturing was developed, Weavers were some of the most highly paid members of the economy, but now their jobs were taken by machines who could produce goods much faster and with more precision. Other industries saw the success that Arkwright and Cartwright were experiencing and began to adapt the factory system, which produced a rapid increase of production. At first, factories were constructed around waterways, which provided the energy to run all of the machinery. Large towns would then be established around these factories because the workers built their houses nearby. Later, as steam power began to spread through Europe, factory construction began to develop elsewhere amongst already established cities and throughout the vast countryside of Great Britain. Good thing the factory spread, otherwise I wouldn't have this sick truck. Trucks. Factories had now become the driving factor of the economy, replacing the majority of skilled workers. All sorts of employees worked in factories, men, women, and even children. Women were favored over men amongst factory owners as they could be paid less for the same amount of work. Often these women had to work 12 hour days or more in factories and then return to feed, clothe, and look after their children. Children were also hired by factories because they could be paid even less than their adult counterparts. When machinery malfunctioned, the children were small enough to climb through the complex configurations and perform any necessary repair work to keep the production line running smoothly. Orphans were especially valuable assets to factory owners because they were easily replaced if injury or death occurred. Injuries and death were daily events amongst machinery workers in the factories. These businesses ran on profit and worker well-being was completely ignored. There was no safety equipment because that would cost money and cut into profits. No safety training was given because that would take time, time that could have been used for production. The requirement to work long, hard hours also contributed to the number of injuries suffered by the people. People were required to work under terrible conditions. Factors such as dust, darkness, exhaustion due to short breaks, and uncovered machinery created a very dangerous work environment. Factory owners were unnecessarily cruel to their employees and believed that their laborers should be grateful that they had an opportunity to work and thank their bosses for the little pay that the workers received. As a part of Britain's aristocratic class of or members of parliament, the factory owners had a strong hold over the laws relating to factories and labor. There were no laws in place to protect workers' rights. Also, there were very few laws pertaining to safety and health regulations. Across all of Britain, there were few inspectors to ensure that the laws were being followed because they were paid little more than the grunt workers manning the machines and were easily bribed. Consequently, factory owners were able to break the few laws that restricted their power with absolutely no repercussions. Factories were able to continue the abuse of their workers because they were not required to keep any records of employment. They could hire people of any age or not pay their workers in full, and if anyone was deemed as working unsatisfactory due to injury or for any other reason, they could easily be replaced. You mean they didn't get 401k? I certainly would not have wanted to work in a factory at those times. However, not all factory owners were so cruel to their workers. Many owners, such as Arkwright, cared for the needs of their laborers. Education, housing, and churches were all provided to the employees of Richard Arkwright. Workers were also subjected to horrible living conditions outside of the factories. Workers built their houses near the factories and established large cities. Cheap, ramshackle, multi-story houses known as tenements were built in the slums. 
Each family would own a single room, and each tenement would house multiple families. The tenements had no running water, sewage system, or sanitation system. There was no form of garbage removal, and trash would just be thrown on the streets, and it would sit there and rot. These urban areas were extremely crowded and filthy. Diseases such as cholera ran rampant amongst the densely populated urban cities. The factory system created many benefits to Europe during industrialization. An increase in production stimulated the economy. The surplus of goods produced allowed for a boom in population. Goods promoted trade between powerful nations and facilitated in forming strong alliances between growing world powers. A massive amount of growth was seen in social classes, increasing wealth for the upper middle class and wealthy. Machinery was able to create higher quality goods at a faster rate and at much more inexpensive price. Factories grew in number exponentially during this time and it resulted in a rapid growth of urban cities. Almost every city became home to one or more factories. Manchester is a perfect example of how the introduction of factories helped cities flourish. As a small market town, Manchester was home to only 17,000 people in the 1750s. However, as the textile industry became industrialized, the city became a center of economic prosperity. After factories were introduced into the city of Manchester, it experienced a rapid population growth reaching 40,000 occupants by the 1780s. At the beginning of the 19th century, the town's population soared to 70,000. Opportunity for a new life also increased for some. Before this time, your job was determined by what your parents did. If you grew up as a farmer, then you would become one. If your parents were bakers, then that would become your profession. The vast arrangement of jobs in the factory system defied this cultural norm. Another benefit is that the increase in factories and production rates encouraged competition between the rival companies and vastly it decreased the prices of goods. The factory system helped to create an economy based on free enterprise. Being my parents were models, it's a good thing I didn't have to go into that profession. Now time to lighten the mood with some funny history jokes. Why were the early days of history called the Dark Ages? Because there were so many nights. Why is England the wettest country? Because the queen reigned there for years. How did Vikings send secret messages? By Norse code. Who invented fractions? Henry the one fourth. See guys, history can be fun, but you know it was not fun? Factories during the Industrial Revolution. The factory system was also flawed in a number of ways. Because the wealthy factory owners were only concerned with production rates and profit margins, workers' well-being was not considered. The workers were forced to work long, hard hours with little time for breaks in dangerous work environments. Although the increase in population was beneficial at first, city centers quickly fell victim to overpopulation. Workers were forced to live in overcrowded tenements and their living conditions became very similar to their horrible work environment. Pollution caused by the burning of fossil fuels also began to become a problem. Carbon dioxide released from the coal caused pollution to the air and waterways, just one of the many factors that played a role in decreasing the people's living conditions. Polluted waterways! That's right, kids. They didn't have Fiji water back then. Unless, of course, you lived in Fiji. But Fiji wasn't actually a country yet, so... For the better part of a century, workers were subjected to horrible conditions that you have previously heard about. But in the mid-1800s, things began to change for the better. Starting in the year 1830, lawmakers in Parliament began to see the injustices and abuses that the workers had suffered for decades. After investigating factories and coal mines, it was discovered that children as young as four were forced to do dangerous jobs in the factories. Parliament slowly began to pass child labor laws, and labor unions began to form in order to protect the rights of workers. The wealthy factory owners' power was weakened with the passing of each new law. The Industrial Revolution that occurred in Britain started in the early 1700s and continued into the 19th century and slowly began to sp spread throughout Europe and eventually the rest of the world. A major reason for the success seen in this time period 
was a direct result of the introduction of the factory system. Production rates rapidly grew and an increase in goods led to the stimulus of the econ economy, bringing massive wealth to Europe. Although industrialization caused many hardships, it also led to materialistic gain.